Howdy, it's Pete Thorne. Welcome to another one of my Q&As where I answer the questions that you ask me by going to my Facebook music page. It's facebook.com slash guitar nerd and you can send me a Facebook message there. I used to call them email, but it's actually called a Facebook message, isn't it? So send me a Facebook message uh, at my Facebook music page and I will get to your question uh, as soon as I can uh, in one of these Q&A episodes. So, okay, uh, let's get started right away here. Steve from Seoul, Korea asks, uh, it says he loves my channel. Thanks, Steve. Um, and uh, he's curious about uh, how I go about designing my recording studio spaces. How do I know when it's time to change things up? And uh, what is my design process when it comes time to tear it all down and move into a new configuration? Well, um, so with the first studio studio space I had, it was really like a little one-bedroom house. And that's when you watch the videos that I did way back in like 2010, 2011. I had another space even previous to that, like where I filmed that eruption video series years ago. Uh, that, that was just, you know, where I lived. Um, so then I moved my studio into like a one bedroom house sort of configuration. Uh, and it was really, you know, it was a home studio. It was really just like a, a, a living room area where I ha actually had the studio space set up. And then there was a closet. Uh, that was great for, uh, you know, putting a little isolated 112 speaker cabinet in. So that's what I did. The first thing I did was I built an ISO box for that speaker cabinet. I, you know, went and bought all the supplies from, uh, you know, hardware store and, and made a, a box as big as I could that would fit in that closet. Lined it all with, uh, you know, uh, like 702 style uh, uh, insulation type stuff, you know, sound absorption sort of material. And closed it up, put the cabinet in there. I hated the way it sounded. I didn't like it. It just sounded... Uh, boxy to me for lack of a better term so what I did then was I ripped the box apart and uh, I just took the soft stuff from the inside of the cabinet and I bought a little bit more uh, of that kind of sound absorption material uh, from a place called atsacoustics.com which is a great resource and all I did was I put the 112 in that closet and I would just surround it with all that stuff and kind of try and deaden it down quiet and quiet it up because the, this place I was in actually did have one shared wall with another residence uh, but I never got one complaint from anybody that was living over there. I could crank that cabinet up pretty good, you know, within the realm of reasonable volume because it was a 112. I didn't want to blow that little speaker in there. That's how I made most of my album Guitar Nerd, was recording the guitar tones uh, just with that 112 in that little closet. Now, it, it sounded a lot better to me when I didn't have the, the enclosed box closing up the cabinet. Um, you know, something about just not having hard surfaces surrounding, you know, it was like like more open space because the closet walls were obviously a little bit bigger and I could just kind of surround it with the soft stuff and it sounded fine. Um, long story short, I mean, the only other treatment that was in there was some panels from ATS Acoustics up on the walls to kind of deaden down things. I had a bass trap and it was very unscientific. I didn't really know what I was doing, but, um, but it sounded fine and I recorded my record there. Uh, so then uh, I moved into the, to another studio space in Santa Monica, and it was really just um, you know a built-out office space was what it was. Most of the the stuff that was going on in that space where that studio were put, you know the majority of my videos were filmed. Um, there was a lot of t film and television music going on in there with other composers doing things in other rooms. Uh, and the rooms were not really constructed uh, acoustically properly or anything like that. They were just it was almost like an office space. So I hired a guy uh, to come in and you know check out the room and, and treat it. And he built those uh, wood panels that you see up on the the walls in my current space. And they were you know I got them for the previous space. And, and he designed them and built them and kind of treated that space to to deaden it down and you know make it so there wasn't any standing waves and make it a, a you know acoustic space that I could actually mix in and properly record in. And I put a lot of money into that. I mean it was like. I don't know, I want to say it was close to 10 grand to, to actually acoustically treat that whole room and have those custom panels built. Um, you know, I, I invested some money in that. So, of course, when I moved into my new studio space, which is the one I'm currently in, uh, you know, four years later, I took all that stuff with me. So I took all those panels. Now, technically, I think he designed those panels for the dimensions of the room that I was in previously. The room I'm in now is actually a little bit smaller. and. You know, the guy that designed the panels would probably say, oh, you should have had me, you know, do new stuff. But um, it's just too expensive, too much of an expense. And it, the new room sounds great with that stuff in there. It's it's really terrific what he did as far as a mix position. Um, you know, I've got those big wood panels that are on either side of me. And they, you can't really tell from the videos that you've seen me in, but they actually sort of slant out. So, 
I don't know how to describe it, but they're, they're, they're bigger on one side than they are on the other. And they've got, a, they're full of absorption material. And the wood is all at kind of sort of displaced, uh, you know, points. And, and the wood sort of is, is meant to dis diffuse uh, frequencies above 350 hertz. And then the panel is meant to absorb all the frequencies below 350. So it's suck up all the low mids and bass that kind of clouds things up, and, but not deaden too much. That's why they're, you know, you've still got all that sort of hard wood surface there that's just kind of broken up and is meant to diffuse sound. Okay, so other than that, I've got a cloud, over what I call a cloud over my mix position, which is another great big panel full of absorption stuff that's at an angle, and it goes over top of my mix position. And then I've got bass traps in all the corners, sucking up low end. And that's about it, really, as far as uh, treatment in the room goes. Now, you can go to, like I say, atsacoustics.com. You can see pictures of rooms that have been designed and kind of treated with their panels. They, I think, are, for most people doing a home studio situation or a built-out kind of space that they're just sort of retrofitting, trying to make it sound better, ATS is a great resource. And for maybe four to $500, you can get all the panels from them that you would need to sort of properly treat a nice home studio space and, you know, uh, uh, really tighten up the sound. Um, uh, of whatever um, you know room that you're trying to work with um, so I hope that helps um, I don't really know what I'm doing I did when I moved into that you know my last previous studio space I did hire somebody to come in and help me out and uh, and he did make it sound really good so that could be another option to look for somebody locally that's used to recording studio design and how to properly acoustically treat rooms okay um, moving along uh, David Bruner asks uh, he says he enjoys my videos a bunch thanks David uh, he says he understands that uh, most guitarists feel that wood affects tone on solid body electric guitars and uh, the wood that a neck is made out of and fingerboard is made out of is also a big contributor to the tone. He doesn't take issue with that but wondered uh, what is the best semi-scientific explanation you've come across as to why that happens. Uh, pickups just read the oscillations of a string in a magnetic field, right? Or is that not the whole story? You know, that's actually a good question for John Sir, because he's explained it to me uh, in detail, and he thinks about it very scientifically. So I might have to get back to you on this. But all I know is that I instantly hear differences in woods. And I have, at this point, a really, really good sort of uh, handle on what different woods sound like. So, for example, a while ago I did a video that's on my channel where I demonstrated some different Sur guitars that had different uh, body woods, but all the other specs were virtually the same. Uh, uh, in one of the examples, I'm demonstrating a Swamp Ash uh, Sur T-style guitar to an Alder Body T-style guitar. And I think in, in YouTube, even in YouTube land, if you listen to that video, I play the same lick through the same amp tone, and you can clearly hear the difference between the two guitars and it is a difference that is consistent with my experience with those two different woods, alder and swamp ash for a body. When I think of swamp ash, I think of more scooped, hollowed out mids, it's got the springy kind of thing. Alder is a more even kind of tone with a sort of, you know, a stronger mid-range, maybe a little less sparkle on the top end. Um, yeah, that's just what it sounds like, and I know that. Uh, if you make a Les Paul out of anything other than Les Paul woods, which is mahogany body, mahogany neck, rosewood fingerboard, in a maple top. You change up that uh, uh, formula at all and I hear it right away. So for instance in the 70s Gibson went to maple necks because they were having problems with headstock breakage and strength and things like that. So uh, you know a maple necked 70s Les Paul with uh, an ebony fingerboard like they made customs back then, that is a completely different sounding guitar uh, than you know what we think of as sort of the classic Les Paul design you know that's made in the 50s and the way they make them again now. Um, it's another good example. Um, I mean, ebony for a fingerboard, it's just got this snappy, fast attack that is different than, you know, maple has also got kind of a snappy, fast attack, but it's different somehow. And then rosewood has, you know, just a different thing uh, going on as well. When I think of rosewood, it's sort of warmer. It's, it's still got a snap to it, but it's warmer and it's got a, you know, rosewood board strat compared to a, a maple board strat. The maple board strat's always got that sort of more sparkly, snappy thing going on. Uh, and they feel different, of course, too, so that's another big factor. Scientifically, I don't know. I'm going to hit up John Sir, and maybe I'll put a post on my Facebook page or something about this question and kind of give him, or, yeah, sorry, give him the, the opportunity to give me a scientific answer, because uh, he did once, and I can't remember what he said. <laughs> but uh, anyway, 
Okay, so moving right along, yeah, I'm a firm believer that wood definitely affects uh, the, the, the tone of electric guitars. And the guys that say that it doesn't, just, I don't know. That doesn't make any sense to me. Um, let's see. Uh, Joey asks, uh, how do I go about choosing new pickups for my guitars? And can I recommend some Strat pickups that aren't too harsh in the bridge position? Uh, well, my favorite sort of aftermarket Strat pickups, and not that I've tried a ton of the other stuff that's out there these days, but I've always had really good success with the SIRS, and I'm using the uh, V60 LPs. Um, actually, in the neck of my Strat, my old 60s Strat, um, that guitar has a, uh, I believe what is a, a Landau uh, my, my ML Classic SIR pickup in the neck. And it's because the neck pick, the, I had the original neck pickup on my 60s Strat, and it sounded a little dull to me, or a little dark or something, and uh, John Sir measured it, and he said, you know, it's got a really low resonant peak, he said, why don't you try this other pickup and see what you think, it's, you know, I think it's going to work for you, and I tried it, and it just it sounds like magic in there, so, um, so I've got that pickup in there now, uh, and the other ones are stock. Um, so, uh, but, but uh, having said that, the uh, V60 LP is the, the single coil from Sur that I really like in all my other guitars. That pickup sounds great. LP stands for low peak, low resonant peak. So it, they're gonna be a little warmer than some Strat pickups. They have a lower um, resonant treble peak, as I understand it. And uh, it gives them sort of a stronger kind of greasy mids kind of thing. Uh, still lots of clarity and all that stuff. Um, so that might be a pickup you wanna check out. Uh, in addition to that, one thing to consider is that you uh, not too harsh in the bridge. I've got a tone control on all my strats on the bridge pickup, and that's the same thing that Eric Johnson does and Scott Henderson. I've talked about this before, where you you wire uh, the tone control that would normally be, excuse me, on the middle position uh, on a strat. You just wire it to the bridge pickup instead, and then you roll the tone back. You can roll it back to about seven or six on the tone control or something like that, and that'll tend to make the bridge pickup on a strat balance just beautifully with the neck in the middle. You can kind of EQ the amp for the neck pickup, you get a nice clear bell-like tone, and then hit the bridge pickup, it'll seem maybe a little too bright, too edgy, just roll that tone control back a little bit and smooth it right out, and now you've got this great balance between all the pickup positions. So um, for sure, give, give that uh, a try. Okay, Jonathan Bell is next up, and he says, uh, he's followed me for a while on YouTube, thanks Jonathan, and um, uh, he's been recording guitar, bass, and vocals for a long time, and he's considering moving some of his processing to outboard gear. So I assume he means instead of using plugins, uh, he wants to start running lead guitar tracks through EQ and compression to stave on processing power and mix time. Uh, and he also wants to be able to expand in the future. You know, he says I use 19-inch rack mount equipment as well as uh, 500 series. Uh, and was wondering which setup I prefer or recommend. Well, to be honest. Um, are there any budget-friendly units I would recommend uh, for someone starting out? To be honest, uh, man, I, I do everything in the box. I don't I don't do that. Uh, so as far as running out into a 500 series rack and using EQ posts and stuff like the only thing that I use my rack mount units for that I have in my studio on the 500 series rack is for recording, you know, getting input signal into my interface. So I'm never like in when I go to mix, I'm never, you know, using aux sends and running things out back through 500 series gear or anything like that. It's kind of time consuming. I get worried about the extra stage of uh, A to D and D to A conversion, although I probably shouldn't because people do it all the time. But um, I find with the plugins these days, uh, and I'm a big, you know, uh, big user of UA plugins as well as the Steven Slate stuff. I don't know, I mean, the, the pros are all using them in, these days, the pro mixing guys, and so that's just what I do. Um, I love the 500 series stuff I have. I've got some terrific Chandler mic pre's and uh, EQs and compression, uh, as well as mic pre from Maris. I've got a new reverb from them. Now, I do have a reverb from Maris that they just sent me that's a 500 series uh, reverb unit, and I'm really excited to try that thing out. Uh, so, I may change my tune on this and be running things out through that reverb, um, you know, that, that, that weren't necessarily recorded with, recorded with reverb. Uh, but um, it's just so easy using plugins, to be honest, uh, you know, as far as for EQ and compression, things like that. And they sound so good these days that that's the way that I do it. So I would recommend still going that way. And if you haven't tried the, the plugins from either uh, Slate Digital or Universal Audio, give those a try. And, and you might change the way that you feel about, uh, ab about things. Um, 
you know, the, the UA stuff, you know, you can always get what's called a UA satellite or you run, you run an, uh, a UA interface and then all the processing is done. The DSP actually happens within their interface on DSP that's in there or it happens within the UA satellite unit. So it's, your computer's taking no processing hit. Um, so that could be a good way to go. I find the Slate plugins are incredibly efficient as far as uh, a hit. Those are uh, native plugins that run off the CPU in your computer, but I find they're just really, really efficient and don't create a big uh, a drain on the CPU at all, so you might give those a try as well. Uh, okay, Alex wants to know, uh, he says, uh, how do I like my Strat type guitars set up? And by set up, he means the string height, string tension. Well, I set them up as easy to play as possible because I'm kind of a wuss when it comes to you know high action and heavy strings and things like that. I just don't do that. I play 10 gauge strings and there's times where I'm feeling like, man, I, I want to go to nines or maybe 9.5s, which, um, you know, it's just, I'm just, uh, the older that I get, the less I want to fight my guitars. Now, having said that, I hate buzzing, so it's like this combination of always trying to get that balance. So, when I'm uh, doing the truss rod, here, I'm going to grab a guitar here really quick. Uh, the, the most important thing to making a guitar play good, I find, is, well, you got to obviously set the action right and all that stuff, but the truss rod is just the biggest thing. And the way that I check the truss rod on all my guitars is I simply hold the string I think I demonstrated this in one of these videos already. I'm sorry if I did, but for people that haven't seen it, I hold the string uh, down at the 22nd fret, and then I also hold it at the first fret, and then I simply go like this. So I'm doing this on the third string, holding it with my thumb at the end of the neck, my first finger down there, and I simply go like this, and I look at the amount of relief, and there's barely any relief happening right now. This guitar could actually use a little bit more. It's been raining in France a lot, so the necks are changing a lot, but you want to see just the smallest amount of relief, this is how I set up my guitars, the smallest amount of relief at the 12th fret and just even a little less relief when you say you move down the neck with your thumb here to the say the 14th fret or so and you kind of look around the 7th fret there should still be just a hair you know of relief there where you can push the string down and touch the fret and if there isn't then um, it means that your neck is bowed like this because the highest point on the neck is here or, you know and then what's going to happen is you're going to get some buzzing down here but if there's just a hair of relief and you've got a good fret dress going um, and, the, and the action at the bridge is not set too low then you're going to be in good shape and you should have a really really comfortable low action uh, so having said all that what else do I do well I've been setting the bridge if I've got a strat right strat type tremolo bridge on my guitars. I've been setting it up so I get about a whole step of up bend on the G string uh, as far as how I set the springs and the tremolo. Um, yeah, and other than that, it's, you know, I just set the intonation by checking at the, uh, at the 12th fret and sometimes checking other places on the neck as well. And uh, yeah, that's about it, really. Try and set the curvature of the saddle so that they match the radius of the neck. Pretty straight board. Um, even on guitars like this that have what I think the Sur guitars use is what's called a tusk uh, nut that are supposed to be kind of slippery and stuff, I still use this stuff called Big Ben's Nut Sauce, which is <laughs> it's an awesome name, but it's, it's basically like this uh, lubricant that you can get and um, look for, search on the internet for Big Ben's Nut Sauce and you'll find this stuff. It's great. You just put a little bit in the nut slots of the guitar and it alleviates tuning problems, just especially on Les Pauls. Oh, it's the best on Gibson style headstocks. Absolutely a prerequisite for me on a Gibson guitar or any three on outside headstock, really. But I even use it on my Sirs, and it just seems to keep things um, in tune that much better. Okay, uh, let's see here. Uh, Russell asks, uh, do I or have I ever done any ear training exercises? Is there any that I would recommend? Uh, when I first went to MI, I used to do these ear training exercises where they had these really primitive computers because it was ages ago, back in the dark ages when I went there. But um, they had these really cool exercises where um, this computer program would play you two intervals. So it would play you the root and, you know, major third or root and a, uh, flat seven. Or, and you'd have to identify them on the computer when, when you'd hear the two tones. And you could set sort of the speed that it would play the intervals at or it would play them together as a dyad and then you put your answer in and it was like I did that for a while and um, I started doing it over an octave so it would play you like you know uh, I don't know an 11th or 13th or different intervals like that and uh, I got better and better at identifying after about a month I was like nailing them pretty much 100% of the time so that was really cool that was a very helpful uh, exercise and other than that for ear training um, 
just learning songs off records and learning how to dissect solos uh, and you know with all these tools these days like Transcribe which I use all the time uh, it's an awesome uh, program for learning songs you can slow things down you can EQ things you can uh, use this sort of karaoke function which removes the center channel so you can hear what's going on panned hard left and right easier and that, that is a really really great tool for learning material just learning stuff and just the act of sort of doing it um, you get better and better and better at it and uh, it's really really cool because uh, you know just through practice you sense yourself getting better at learning solos and I would just say just transcribe parts you know learn solos pick solos from your favorite guitar players you get something like transcribe and uh, dive deep into learning stuff and you know I, I can remember clearly being like 13 years old or 14 years old and sitting there spending like 45 minutes learning about two bars of music really you know whatever was, I was shreddy stuff I was working on at the time but trying to learn phrases and to get every single note and I would slow things down and listen to just little bits of music at a time and after a while your brain just gets trained you start to hear it's almost like learning a new language where you start to hear it as not being fast anymore even if it is a fast phrase you can hear all the notes individually and your brain just clues into it after a while and that, that's a really cool feeling um, I'm sure some of you out there know what I mean but a fast passage is just start to sound very clear and almost like slow not fast anymore even though they are uh, and that just comes through practice and through doing it I think um, Okay, uh, Brian Newber asks, uh, he says he's trying to decide between a Marble 3 pedal and a Schaefer replica pedal, both of which I've done demos of. He's going for a clean, strong overdrive that isn't too fizzy when playing lead. He's got a Marshall DSL 100 and a DSL 40, and he's currently pushing them with a Soul Food, which is kind of like a clonish pedal. Uh, which one would I suggest for a strong ACDC sound? Well, the Schaefer uh, is undoubtedly... I mean, you've already got kind of a, a Marshall-style amps, right? So, or Marshall amps. So you've got the amp part covered. Uh, you know, if you want to just kind of copy what Angus is doing right now, just go ahead and get the, the, the Schaefer. And it's, it's a really, really cool sounding, basically a boost pedal is what it is, with um, a hint of compression in there. And uh, that's going to give you that sound. So that's, that's what I would do, since you've already got the overdrive covered on the amp. Crank the clean channel, so the, the green channel. Crank the gain all the way up, then set that, kind of like you would on a JCM 800 style Marshall, and then set the overall volume using the master, and then just hit that with the pedal and boost it a little bit. ATDC is not real dirty. It's like you want to get it just to the point where you can play a lead and it's sustaining, but not overly saturated and compressed. Um, so that, that should uh, should be good, I would think. Uh, okay, uh, let's see, Desmo asks, uh, actually, that's not his name. Sorry, Jan. I don't know why it says Desmo. Jan from Toronto <laughs> uh, asks, uh, what are my thoughts on uh, electric guitars and whether or not they change over the years sonically? Like, do they sort of break in? Um, he asked because he some, owned some that seemed okay initially and over the years they seem to get better uh, and others never really changed. Well, I don't know. Um, acoustic guitars definitely do. I, I feel pretty strongly about saying that, that, and you know, I think there's some scientific evidence that sort of as uh, things vibrate, wood vibrates, it's, there's cellular change in the wood, uh, the structure of the wood, and you know, once again, it'd be a good question for Sir, uh, but also things dry out over time, and as wood dries out and sort of um, becomes harder and dry, you know, the moisture comes out of it, I think it sounds different, it sounds kind of more bellow-like or something, and more, yeah, just more alive. Uh, it makes sense, right? The more moisture that's in something, it, it, it's going to sound kind of deader and a little more dampened. So, um, so, yeah, I think guitars change over time. I do. Uh, and the good ones only get better. Um, you know, sort of, I, I mean, a, a good sounding guitar probably started out sounding good and then just got better. I think you're, you're probably right about that. Okay, Scott asks uh, about uh, scumbag speakers. He says that I made some demos for them a few years ago and those demos were a major influence on his purchase of an M75 and H75 uh, scumbag speaker models for uh, one of his 212 cabinets. Uh, so he wants to know if I use the scumbag still. He says he's seen me do demos for Celestion and Austin Speaker Works, and he wants to know how I still feel about the Scumbacks. But Jim makes great speakers. The Scumbacks are really cool sounding speakers. Great um, takeoffs on old Celestions. And I, I really dig uh, what he does. I like a lot of the Celestion speakers too, and the Austin Speaker Works. Um, it's, it's like I don't have an exclusive deal with any uh, speaker manufacturer. I can kind of use what I want. 
Um, so there's all these different factors that come into play. One of them is availability and another one is cost. So for instance, in the new PT100 um, uh, 212 cabinets, when we were coming up with a cabinet, uh, you know, we had to uh, take cost into consideration for sure. And some of the boutique speakers are quite expensive and those costs get passed on to you guys when you're buying a speaker cabinet. It makes it kind of cost prohibitive to offer certain speakers. So uh, we looked at things that we felt like sounded great and were reasonably priced. Now I tried the uh, Creamback speakers, speakers from Celestion and you know we were trying all kinds of speakers, mixing and blending and trying different stuff and two Creamback H speakers just sounded awesome to me and that's what I use now in the Sir 212s and what we offer in the cabinet. Uh, they sound good from crystal clean all the way through to you know really distorted and lead tones. They're just a lot of clarity, lots of sparkle in the clean sounds. They sound articulate, but they're not too bright and piercing like some H30 designs can be. Um, just a really, really nice sounding speaker, and they're a reasonable price, so they were like a no-brainer. We just went, well, this, the speaker's got it all, so let's do this. Um, do I still like the other stuff? Yeah, I love a whole bunch of different speakers. You know, the, the Celestion Greenback that they make in China, so I think it's about 90 bucks to buy it just about anywhere, that speaker sounds awesome. Um, really, really good, warm, woody, does that Greenback thing, does it really well. The Scumbacks, they sound great to me. Um, they're a little bit maybe warmer on the top end, the M75. It's got a little bit less uh, sort of like a fizzy edge on it or something, but sometimes that fizzy edge might work for some guys if you're trying to play metal with it or something. Do you want the warmer, bluesier thing? You know, it's just, it's all open to interpretation of what you can afford and what you want to do. Um, the Austin Speaker Works speakers are really nice too. They've got a speaker called a Crossroads that I really, really enjoyed using. I've got them loaded in a vintage style 412. I love that thing. Um, that speaker, for some reason, in this shootout that George Metropolis did uh, a number of years ago, about four years ago, the, the AS Austin Speaker Works speaker uh, just did not sound good. And I, I have no idea why that was because it almost sounded like it was out of phase or something, like compared to all the other speakers. Like, it was really hollow and weak sounding and strange. That doesn't make sense to me because I've got videos up on my YouTube where I'm using that speaker and it's awesome. And I tried it out again recently, the cabinet. I, brought it, plugged it in, I plugged it in next to some other cabinets, it still sounds great to me. It's got a sort of a more relaxed tone, the Crossroads speaker, uh, like a worn in, broken in greenback. Sounds really good with um, a bright Marshall style lamp because it'll take some of that edge off. And so I'm a big fan of that thing. But anyway, lots of great speakers out there. Um, so, uh, okay, last question for today. Chai asks, do I use Spotify? And the answer is no, I don't. Um, my reason for not being on Spotify and not using Spotify is that they just screw artists. Um, you know, if you're, uh, I don't know, Justin Timberlake or something, I guess you can afford to be on Spotify, but he's still not making any money off of it, you know? Um, if you're an independent, uh, uh, you know, artist like myself and you're not selling a lot of, you're not getting a lot of spins in, you know, streaming world, and certainly not selling tons and tons of records, it just doesn't make sense. It's like, um, it sucks because it's the way the whole industry is going towards the streaming thing. But, uh, you know, I support paid streaming. I'm an Apple Music uh, subscriber, so I pay 10 bucks a month and I use that for some stuff. I still buy records, I buy, you know, if, you're, if it's an independent artist and it's somebody, uh, you know, like myself, you know, you gotta go buy their music and support them because otherwise they just, they gotta go work at 7-Eleven or something. There's just no other way to make any money. They're not going to make any money off streaming. If everything was streaming and they had no income at all from um, you know, being able to sell the few records that we sell in the sort of small instrumental guitar market, man, the streaming's just not, it's, gonna, it's just going to kill it for everybody. Which might happen. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I really don't. But I just opted to not put my music on Spotify and not have it on Apple Music and, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, I, I would say that go ahead and use the streaming, pay for the premium service of Spotify or Apple Music. That's what I do. I pay for the Apple Music. If it's an independent artist, I try and go buy the album because I know how I feel about that stuff. If it's a big artist, you know, stream it, pay the money. They're making a little bit off the stream, I guess. I don't know. And that's kind of the best you can do in today's climate. Uh, that's it. All right. Uh, I'm Pete Thorne. Thanks for watching this q and I got a little long-winded, I know, but thanks for watching the whole thing if you made it this far. Uh, please hit subscribe if you haven't, and uh, go ahead and send me a uh, question at uh, facebook.com slash guitar nerd. You can uh, send me a Facebook message there, and I'll get to your question just as soon as I can in one of these videos. All right, take care. Have a great week. See ya.